everybody, you're listening to the Comic Book Bears Podcast. I'm Billy Z. And I'm Steve Morey. Hey everybody, this is Bill Zanowitz from the Comic Book Bears Podcast. And before you listen to this episode, I just wanted to give you a little background regarding it. The last episode, which was episode 141, was initially intended to include the interview that we conducted with John Horsley, who was promoting his Ein's Anthology Kickstarter, And then the second half of the show was going to be myself and Steve talking about our favorite horror comics of all time. Unfortunately, we hit a lot of technical issues when I went in to edit the episode. And because of the time constraint of the impending Kickstarter campaign, we decided to release the interview with John separately as its own episode. So now we're finally coming to you with the second half. Now it's own thing. So right after the explosion, you'll hear Steve and myself talking about our favorite horror comics of all time. Welcome back to the Bear Cave of Terror. Okay, well, let's continue on with our spooky January. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, know, I know it'll make you groan. But I was literally <laughs> writing stuff out today. And, you know, I think ahead with the episode titles and what music is going to be the bumper and all that stuff. and It just came right out spooky January. If you put spooky, scary skeletons as the song. uh... No. Oh, speaking of songs, I think I should mention this because two people asked about this. Uh, We do have a new theme song, and I thought it was high time to retire the Bear in Heaven song, which we've had for a number of years at this point. So we're now on our fourth theme song, and that is a track called Papillon by Editors. It's sort of my own little edit of the opening riff. I hope you like it again. The name of the band is Editors, and the song is Papillon. Two people had asked about that, so clarifying that for people listening. So again, we're going to be talking about horror comics for the remainder of the episode. Steve, when you think of horror comics, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Now, I'm not saying you're necessarily your favorites. When you were first exposed to horror comics, what was it, basically? Oh, you know, when I first saw what I thought of at the time as horror comics, and it's kind of like there's this archetype that you think of when you hear the word horror comic, you think immediately, and I, well, at least I did EC comics from Mm -hmm. the fifties, the reprints that were available, um, you know, in the eighties and and early nineties that you could find, um, you know, those were what I read. And in fact, and I want to like, it, it was really funny thinking about this, but in, um, I want to say it was junior high, uh, in our school library, we actually did have the large format reprints. Mm-hmm. Um, they had collected them into, you know, into like large paperback, um, you know, sort of book treasuries, basically, of, you know, old tales from the crypt. And immediately when I think of horror comics, I was like, oh, that that old EC stuff with the, you know, very particular types of uh, uh, of art and, you know, the the very. Mostly it's uh, it's stories, but there's a lot of ironic twists at the end, you know, like this thing is really spooky or there's some kind of like gory whatever, but you don't really get it until t- the very end, you know. Um, there's a lot of O. Henry twists uh, yes. in those stories. <laughs> now, I have to say there are four very big gaps in my comic reading experience. One is Hellboy, mm. and extending to BPRD and the rest of the Nullverse. Second is Judge Dredd. Mm-hmm. Third, I would have to say, is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then the fourth is EC Comics. I know more huh. about EC Comics than the level that I've actually read them. Mm-hmm. I have some exposure to some of the more classic stories like Judgment Day, and especially if it was a marquee artist like Wally Wood or Johnny Craig. <clears throat> they were a little easier to come by mm-hmm. in reprints. These stories have continued in print in one form or another, but they've tended to be expensive in – You know, these anthologies where they gather four or five copies of the book. And it was something I've always backburnered because I always figured, you know, they're going to be around. (laughs) It's it's like Breaking Bad. I don't have to watch it now. It'll be here in 20 years. You know, (laughs) they're they're never never going to stop reprinting. But I do have to say that I'm surprised, like, how little I've read of the EC Comics canon compared. And actually, I actually own an EC comic from 1948, I think. Uh, but it's not a horror comic. It's a, it was based on a, a radio series called The Land of the Lost, not the Croft. Sid Marty Croft. Like, uh, the, classic, yeah, quote unquote. Yes. But it was like these, these kids who would dream and go <laughs> off to a land of toys. So I actually own like what actually was published by Educational Comics. 
an actual comic, but it's not in that canon. It's someday I'll get to it. I think maybe after this show that might motivate me to start obtaining some more of that stuff. So that's interesting because it's so far before your time, and yet exactly. that was one of your first exposures to the notion of horror comics because of the reissues. Uh, for me, <clears throat> again, I'm old as sand. Uh, so my <laughs> reading experience started in the 70s. And at the time, both Marvel and DC were publishing a number of horror comics, but it was very different publishing strategies. Marvel were more character-based, so you had books like Werewolf by Night and Tomb of Dracula and Monster of Frankenstein. Some of the titles like Fear and Creatures on the Loose had characters like Morbius and Manwolf who were headlining the, those titles at the time. And while DC did have some character-based horror comics like Phantom Stranger and Swamp Thing specifically, it was mostly anthologies at the time. So you had House of Mystery and House of Secrets and Ghosts, The Witching Hour. Actually, I think what probably was my first horror comic ever was a 100-page Super Spectacular of The Witching Hour. And mm. one of my oldest surviving comics from childhood is this would have been a, a comic I got within the first three or four months that I was reading comics, is an issue of Weird War Tales. I still have the oh, actual yeah. copy from when I was a little six-year-old tyke. And <laughs> so that was DC and Marvel at the time, and that's what I still consider horror comics, my principal notion of what they're like. Well, you know, EC, I think, because the legacy is so long-lasting, most people know EC Comics from the other media that it spawned. I mean, mm -hmm. there was the movie in the 70s. There was the actual theatrical film in the in the 80s, the two of them, actually, and um, the TV series on HBO. And, Tales from the Crypt, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're bringing it back again, so now it's being revived over uh, – so, someone's reviving. I'm not sure if it's HBO, but, it, you know, it, it's one of those things that lasts. So people, even if they don't – haven't read the comics, they're, they're going to know – the Crypt Keeper. They're going to know sort of like what to expect. It's, you know, a scary version of Twilight Zone. Um, cause they, they kept that format. In fact, <laughs> they've, they've, uh, you know, mined uh, all those classic stories for the live action versions, um, and updated them as slightly as they could. But, uh, yeah. All right, Steve, well, let's move on to our favorites. And I'm going to start with you. You're going first. I'm not. Why don't you tell me and everyone else listening what some of your favorites are? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I could probably just say that when it comes to the favorites, hands down, it's anything in the Magnoliaverse. Um, so that started with Hellboy. Uh, and Hellboy branched out to the various BPRD series, um, Abe Sapien, the other spinoffs like uh, the um, uh, the Witch Hunter series, uh, even to some extent Lobster Johnson, even though that's more of like a you know um, sort of hard hard boiled sort of uh, street level beat 'em up. There's still some horror elements in there as well with some of the characters that he encounters. Um, but what Mignola sort of started and what other you know, uh, writers and artists have built over the past 20 some years. Um, it has been probably one of the most, uh, completely and fully realized horror universe franchises, um, that I, I could ever describe or, or, or even point to. Um, I mean, you have that much, backstory you've got that you know that much variety but it all connects in together mm -hmm. i mean it's it's amazing and in terms of horror i mean there's not a lot of jump out scares there are some depending on you know which books you're reading and you know which storyline and uh you know that that you're uh, that you're looking at but overall the entire series itself sets it up for uh you know just the most um, visceral, uh, gripping, uh, chilling, uh, low level and high level terror, uh, you know, from month to month. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, even jumping all over in time too, with the various BPRD books where you're going back to the forties and the fifties and kind of seeing the development of the supernatural fighting agency, um, 
it's all pretty fantastic and it all ties in together. And I, I'm kind of sad to see that it will be ending in 2019. They're going to all have everything wrapped up. Um, but I'm hoping that in the future they can revisit um, a lot of what they've set up and what they've introduced over the past, you know, several decades. Um, that hands down is my favorite horror. Uh, you know, you can pick up anything and just, just be riveted to the page uh, for what they're, what they're doing. Okay, for my favorite, I have to go with Swamp Thing. I think that Vertigo started nearly 10 years before it started, when Mm -hmm. Alan Moore took over the book that was currently being published at the time, Saga of the Swamp Thing, uh, with issue 20. Issue 21 is where he really got uh, hold of the reins with the anatomy lesson. I just remember when I had taken a break reading comics for four years. I, I didn't read comics at all for four years. And when I came back and I – actually, my first issue of Swamp Thing was the first appearance of John Constantine. So I had some fill-ins <laughs> to, to get there. You know, So I, I had about a year and a half or so to, to fill in there. It really is a stunning, stunning series you know, so much lyrical beauty and so much absolute creepiness. The issue that I always go to to recommend to people when you did recommend single comics instead of trades was Swamp mm-hmm. Thing Annual 2, which is where Swamp Thing's love, Abby Cable, is in hell and he goes to rescue her. And in what could be considered a really crass visitation around the DC supernatural world, because you do get the Phantom Stranger and you do get the Spectre and you you do get the Demon, somehow more just turns this into this odyssey through the true worst elements of our nature. And it ends with a kiss. It's it's really a stunning work if you ever read that annual on its own because it does somehow stand alone from the the main narrative. But I always recommend to people that you, if you're gonna take reading comics seriously, at some point you have to read Alan Moore Swamp Thing. Uh-huh. That's no diss on the original Swamp Thing, which was written by Len Wein and drawn by Bernie Wrightson. There's mm-hmm. some stunning stuff there in the first couple of issues when the when the book actually started initially in 1971. And there have been other iterations through time, some that are like I think the Morrison and Millar and, and then into Millar uh, solo. There's some pretty good stuff there, but I don't think there's anything that compares to the Alan Moore stuff. It, it was that Alan Moore stuff that kind of gave rise to Constantine period. Like you mentioned, That that's pretty much where he first appeared. Yep. And that's before the crisis. That, yep. Yeah, I mean, that's that's your that's your build up to, like you said, it was Vertigo before Vertigo. If it wasn't for Alan Moore taking over Swamp Thing, we wouldn't have had Constantine, and then we probably wouldn't have had Sandman either. Yeah. Um, not in the, not in the way that uh, that DC kind of not not the direction that DC kind of went with their more adult supernatural you know horror type stories that uh, didn't really have a place elsewhere in the DC universe. So yeah, no, that's in the awesome. midst of all that stuff, some truly terrifying stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of those depictions in hell, whoa. I mean, they've stayed with me my entire life. <laughs> There's some genuine creepiness there. All right, Steve, throw another favorite. Um, you know, I, I could go back to the original Constantine. Um, it was a, it, it was, well, the Hellblazer, I should say. I mean, it was, uh, it was a little rough. I, I'd say like maybe the first, first several issues were a bit rough, but some of those early, uh, standalone issues are some of the best written, um, you know, single issue horror stories I've ever read. Um, one of them I was shocked and amazed that they actually included in the short lived Constantine TV series. Uh, and that is the, the issue with, uh, basically a, a child molester slash serial killer. Uh, who's been murdering young girls and quote unquote marrying them uh, after holding them hostage and and raping them and you know just a very very horrible but real life horror like this is you know some kind of non supernatural premise or build up but what happens the denouement of it is is extremely terrifying um, and yes there's you know there's some kind of comeuppance of course but. It's in a very, uh, I just say, just just a generally creepy and you know more gothic horror kind of way. And I, I think those those kinds of stories 
that were uh that were part of the early you know the early years of Hellblazer were just great. Um, you know, where John Constantine was almost he he interacted, but he was more of an observer most of the time. Um, you know, seeing what kind of horrible things would happen and you know, with very little intervention. Um before it really became all about him. <laughs> okay, well, you mentioned serial killers, and <laughs> I probably shouldn't laugh at that, but I'm a well-known murderino. And the next series that I'm going to recommend is cut from that world, and it shows that there's interplay between true crime and suspense and, and genuine horror. And the book uh, that I'm talking about is Torso, which is co-written by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Andreco and drawn by Brian Bendis. This was well before he gained fame through Ultimate Spider-Man. And the story concerns Elliot Ness, who, after his experiences with putting Al Capone behind bars, you know, which is the basis of the Untouchables, uh, he w uh, spent some time in Cleveland trying to find out who the Cleveland Torso murderer was. Now, this was a murderer who would kill very often drifters. I think only three of the confirmed eight victims were ever identified, beheaded them, and dismembered really, really horrific post-murder actions. And <laughs> you see that in the book. And, of course, it's in some ways a fictionalized speculation of those events, You know, much like From Hell. It does provide Cleveland as much of a character in the book. Uh, in some ways, it's a love letter to Cleveland. It's one of those books where there are two parts in the book where you just have to – I said this during the interview where you just had to back away for a second because it just got too creepy. It has stayed in print now that Bendis is with DC. It's been reissued through the Jinx World imprint and fairly easy to get. Uh, so, yeah, Torso. Did you ever read this? No. No, I haven't. Really good. Really, really good. Huh. And it's sadly, it's one of those properties that has been in development hell for a thousand years, it seems. <laughs> it's a very cinematic telling of this particular story, and it kind of surprises me that nobody's chomped at that bit. But then again, look how long it took for the alienist to get going on the screen of some sure. sort, so. Uh, hopefully we'll see that at some point because uh, I think it would make a hell of a miniseries or even a two-and-a-half-hour film. All right, Steve, give us another one. What's next in your horror list? Well, I was thinking uh, something along the lines of the Sixth Gun series by Cullen Bunn and Brian Hurt. Okay. Um, and there have been some other there have been some other contributors as well, some one-shots and miniseries, um, you know, uh, Going off of the uh, of the world that Cullen Bunn's created, but um, this is one of one that I would kind of consider a crossover genre um, horror comic. So it's not just pure horror; it's also a western. Um, and you know, if you're not familiar with it, and uh, you really should hurry up and get familiar with it, it uh, it takes place in the 1800s, um, sort of in that mythical cowboy age between. Uh, the Civil War and um, the end of Reconstruction and the beginning of the, the real modern age. Um, but in it, of course, it follows uh, six different mystical guns uh, that are quite demonic and have different abilities and the people who are pursuing them. And, of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I'd say hellish figures. Um, there's voodoo. There's hoodoo. Uh, there's a lot of native, um, you know, native supernatural intervention. Uh, you know, just it's it's a very creative, and very complex mythology that Cullen Bunn's created uh, with the Six Gun series. And so, it, you know, if you have a chance, definitely pick it up. Start with book one. Um, it's all been collected. Uh, I believe he's done with it now. Um, but uh, it's all been collected in trades, and uh, you know it reads fast because it's it's so well done. Um, but yeah, the Six Gun series. Even if you don't like westerns, check this one out. Well, I'm going to go back to an earlier book that's already been discussed in some fashion. My next recommendation is Tomb of Dracula from Marvel Comics. The Tomb of Dracula was a series that ran in the 70s. It basically like pretty much was the 70s <laughs> because i believe the last issue was like august 1979 and it started in 1972 it tells the story of the marvel version of count dracula and there are some 
familiar uh, offshoots from Bram Stoker's story, most notably uh, one of the descendants of Van Helsing, Rachel Van Helsing, is a principal character. And with this story, it doesn't really get going until what would have been until what was the seventh issue when Marv Wolfman took over. It also benefited from having the same artistic team through the entire run with Gene Cullen drawing and Tom Palmer inking. And it's no coincidence that this was coming off of the popularity of Dark Shadows, which uh, if people in the, uh, people might be familiar with the reboot, I never know what people know that was before their time. I'm real bad with that. Uh, but Dark Shadows was something that was before my time, which was the 60s into the 70s horror-based soap opera, which played on daytime TV. Certainly, Tomb of Dracula brought in soap opera elements, but it was uh, such a well-crafted series. There were familiar characters that were born out of this series that are still active today, like Blade made his first appearance in Tomb of Dracula. Again, this was also purely a Marvel Comics series, so it was not uncommon to see crossovers. And There's a very strong crossover with Doctor Strange, and it takes elements from the Marvel Universe that you wouldn't expect to see, like the Silver Surfer makes an appearance in issue number 50, which is like, it, it still remains cosmic, yet rooted to horror storytelling. Again, it's very much a Bronze Age series. There are a couple moments reading it through the 2019 glasses where you're like, oh, that dialogue. Those moments are actually pretty much few and far between. I think it's a series that really holds up. Have you ever read any of Tomb of Dracula, Steve? No, I can't say I have. I mean, you know, I'm familiar with the characters. I think that's one of the interesting things that Marvel was able to do really well mm-hmm. by – integrating their horror comics and DC eventually did this too. Um, Mm -hmm. But I mean, it wasn't out of the ordinary to have Dracula show up in the X-Men. In fact, there's a very major uh, role that Dracula's played in the history of the X-Men. Morbius uh, is a very frequent guest star in Spider-Man comics. Um, Blade, of course, you know, had his own series for a while and there's a, you know, uh, he's been more or less making a comeback and, uh, you know, showing up with Heroes for Hire and Daughters of the Dragon and all that. So there's a, you know, Marvel's great with, with integrating those characters. Yeah, I mean, hell, uh, Man Wolf was J. Jonah Jameson's son. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. And that continues to this day. Blade just joined the Avengers. You know? yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, <laughs> that's stuff I love to see. And that, And going back to Alan Moore, I love when he did interplay with those particular mm-hmm. worlds, you know, when the Justice League appeared in Swamp Thing, with <laughs> what I still think is one of the best first pages of a comic book ever, describing the Justice League in terms that you've never heard of before. I love when creators are able to execute that particular interplay. Uh, wow. Mm. Sometimes you see it, and it's not so good. You know, 90s, <laughs> whoa, whoa, there's some moments in the 90s with horror comics from Marvel. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is an example, I think, of one of the better series that isn't afraid of integration with mm. the, the major characters from that publishing company. Well, I, and, you know, kind of along the lines of that, and, uh, you know, we haven't really mentioned it, uh, but I'm not going to go into it too much, but Sandman, Neil Gaiman's Sandman, did flirt – uh, in the Vertigo years, did flirt oh. with the those superhero are some of the best history. Issues. Oh Element yeah, well, Woman I mean, and Prez, those are some of the best issues mm-hmm. in that run. Well, you have that, and then also the major, you know, one of their uh, strongest characters that that lasted through several story arcs and is instrumental in uh, the entire narrative of Sandman was the Silver Scarab and uh oh Lida. gosh, what did she go by? Light uh, she was Light, Fury. Lita Hall she was Fury. as Fury. Yeah. Um from Infinity Incorporated. Uh and you know, Hector Hall, of course, um being uh you know, originally was a Silver Scarab and Infinity Incorporated became, you know, uh the latest version of this of the costumed Sandman. And those played extremely important roles. And Neil Gaiman just was able to integrate them very well into essentially a horror fantasy comic. I uh, love that element of Sandman where you cannot discharge all that's come before it mm-hmm. uh, just to serve your narrative. Because if you do embrace what happened 
previously with at least the characters in name, it betters your property. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that James Robinson with Starman took some of those cues. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I totally agree there. Um, but but what was very interesting is James Robinson did this as, as well as Neil Gaiman, is that even though superheroes existed and superheroes exist in their in their worlds, they only allow them so much influence. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to tell these stories that, you know, if you take it for granted that Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman around the corner probably could not have been told. Yeah. Um, you know, because of the impact on the world around them or um, because of what these characters are going through. I mean, if the Corinthian was walking around the streets anywhere in the United States, you know, uh, killing as many people as he did, I'm sure that at least, you know, Batman or the outsiders would have shown up and tried to hunt him down like that didn't happen like this. You know, he, he was definitely a Sandman only villain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that couldn't be uh, couldn't be integrated elsewhere. But um, yeah, I didn't I didn't want to talk too too much about Sandman because there's there's plenty of other books that uh, you know need some focus there too. All right, well tell us about one. Um, well, I, I wanted to bring up Baltimore, and I I'm not going back to the Magnola verse, and I know that technically Baltimore kind of is in that orbit of the Magnola verse. Um, but it is separate. It is not part of the Hellboy and BPRD story. Um, and Baltimore, of course, uh, was co-created with Christopher Golden. Um, and I believe started out actually as a prose novel. Who, by the way, is an incredibly attractive man. Oh, <laughs> yes, he's a very attractive man. Well, let's, Let's look up some pictures of him. Well, no, you can do um, that later, but you will agree. With me. Yes, I can already agree that. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, this this uh, story was definitely a uh, you know a period piece horror uh, and, and just like horror story mixed with war um, that took place during World War One, an alternate history World War One, where uh, vampires are absolutely real, as are witches and. Um, you know, hellish demons. Um, and in this alternate history, World War I didn't end with the defeat of the Germans and the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Turks. It was um, basically ended because of a massive plague, uh, kind of modeled after the Spanish flu, but uh, more insidious and the results were a little bit more horrific and, uh, you know, uh, disgusting. Um, but in that sort of human vacuum where the human empires of the world have been decimated um, by disease and war, the vampires basically took, uh, uh, took their cue and started um, taking over, or at least making themselves a little bit more known. And uh, it, this, the Baltimore story um, is just incredible. Um, obviously, they use a lot of the same artists uh, that are working on the other Hellboy books. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, visual uh, familiarity um, to how they create the, you know, how the carrier characters appear and, you know, some of the uh, uh, some of the way the supernatural creatures themselves are uh, are constructed. But um, I mean, it is a uh, it's a very divergent universe almost as complex as the bprd universe and if you can read it and of course it's it has been closed this is a it's a story with a real beginning and a real ending so you can go if you find all the uh collected editions reading them all in order is not difficult to do um but it is a, a very very satisfying narrative and uh definitely incorporates a lot of great hell horror elements um you know, and uh, and if you like historical fiction, it's also great. So the Baltimore series. OK, I probably should have taken the reins instead of throwing this over to you for another pick, because the next one in line for me is a character that was actually an offshoot of Sandman. And really? Yeah. And the series I'm going to talk about now, I, I do have to admit the Lucifer series that Mike Carey wrote. I've read very little of it. There was a library. Well, it's still there. Once it's, it's not gone. Uh, but uh, there's a local library that used to have a buyer 
who was very, very proactive with getting Vertigo series, but for some reason Lucifer wasn't part of the mix for them. I guess there's another hole there. I haven't read Mike Carey's Lucifer. But I did read, and I did read this very recently, the reboot of Lucifer that took place between 2015 and 2017, which coincided with the first few seasons of the the series on Fox, though it's a completely different storyline. The series was originally written by Holly Black. The pencils by Lee Garbert was through almost the entire series. There was a changeover at about the... I would say like maybe 60% mark um, and I'm blanking on the gentleman's name who took over the writing chores, but it was almost seamless. Um, Yeah, it's not there. I'm sorry. I can't, I don't have that at my fingertips here. The Lucifer storyline in this particular series. And again, I just read this very recently because I had a big stockpile of books was that God was dead and Gabriel, the angel has accused Lucifer of his murder. Now Lucifer certainly had the motive of the opportunity, but he claims that to prove his innocence and Gabriel is tasked with finding the killer. And if he takes that killer into custody, his sins will be forgiven. Again, he's a fallen angel and he'll be welcomed back into heaven, into the silver city. That's the initial plot. It goes haywire. <laughs> Nothing goes to plan. And you do see very familiar characters like Mazikeen. Since this story has been determined to not be canon with the launch of the new Lucifer series, uh, there are characters that are unique to this series, some very young characters. There's a real sort of controlled frenzy to the storyline, and it's one that I really enjoyed a lot. And at some point I'll get to the Carrie series, but uh, – That's my next recommendation, Lucifer, the 2015 to 2017 series. And I believe you read this, right? Um, I read parts of it. I haven't read the entire thing. So that's, uh, you know, a couple issues here, a couple issues here, unfortunately. That's weird. You wouldn't expect that between the two of us. Yeah, Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, But I have been following the most recent one. So, like, the, uh, the, the latest volume, which is a complete departure. It's very different from... The uh, the other two Lucifer uh, series that keep going. Well, they've already established that it basically is the next step after the last carry issue. It, it is, it is, it is following that whole uh, you know that whole story arc. I'm not sure how much because again I didn't read the uh, much of that second volume, um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's part of that same that same string. Okay, what else you got for me? Oh, pff, of course. Well. Um, <laughs> this one's actually a little bit more recent, um, and I uh, I, I kind of had to preface it by kind of letting you know, letting people know, letting listeners know, um, if you're only really looking at the big three or four uh, major publishers, I mean DC, Marvel, Image, uh, and Dark Horse, there's a lot of great books between you know all four of those guys, uh, but there's other smaller publishers out there that have some amazing stuff. And one of the more recent uh, publishers that's, that's starting to make a real big name for itself, especially in horror comics um, is aftershock. And um, over the past several years, they've put out some amazing dark, scary stuff. Uh, Some other, you know, really interesting sort of genre bending stuff as well. Um, But uh, if you want some good horror you know, check them out too. Uh, so one of the ones that Aftershock started putting out, uh, I believe, uh, I believe it's about two, maybe two and a half years old, the series, uh, Black Eyed Kids um, by Joe Pruitt uh, and drawn by Simon Kadarsky. Uh, this is creepy. It's, it is a slow burn, but really brings to mind sort of that classic Village of the Damned feel. Um and in the series, uh, there's some supernatural force that is somehow taking over children and young people. Um, and, uh, you know, no kid is immune from whatever this force is that's that's taking over their bodies and, and destroying their souls. And so, of course, at that point, that also means that no adult is safe. Um and, you know, through the series, and I've only read the first couple of volumes, there's a, you know, very strong sense of dread 
that really there's no way to stop these, you know, these demonic or possessed children from, uh, you know, continuing their slow takeover of, uh, of humanity. And, um, you know, there's some pretty strong gore in there. There's some great characters that get, that you think are going to do something and then they get killed off pretty quick. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And of course, there's also another, uh, another wrinkle where, um, you know, one adult character is kidnapped and essentially given the task of writing the new history of what's going to happen when uh, the black eyed kids, so-called because they have no eyes, it's all just blackness, um, have taken over and, uh, you know, destroyed all uh, all the rest of humanity. So it's it's a very interesting series, very creepy, atmospheric to the finest. Um, and, uh, you know, I definitely recommend that as well. And of course, you know, if you're still looking at Aftershock, there's some other great books, uh, Baby Teeth, uh, A Walk Through Hell, um, which is pretty incredible. Of course, that's Garth Ennis. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, got, got a name there and Baby Teeth, of course, from Donny Gates, um, and, uh, some other fair, like, uh, uh, Dark Ark, which I believe is written by, uh, Cullen Bunn. Of course, and it's kind of like an alternate Noah's Ark, um, and it's just it's there. There's some really great stuff and really creative stuff that AfterShock is putting out. Well, the next book that I'm going to be talking about is another one that is away from the big two or four. Uh, it was published by Dynamite, and this was published initially between 2015 and 2016, and it's a book called The Devilers, which is written by Joshua Hale Fialkov with art by Matt Triano. And mm -hmm. the storyline concerns an attack on the Vatican from hell. Hell factors in a lot of my stories for some <laughs> reason here today. And, hell! <laughs> and uh, basically, hell is in intending to turn Vatican City into the city of the damned. And rescue workers include this group of people that are called the Devilers. And they're basically like the best exorcists in the world, but from different faiths. The momentum of the series was really marred by substantial delays in the last two issues, unfortunately. There was a book, like, I just forgot about at some point. Like, oh, my God, here's issue six, you know, almost, you know, months and months after the issue five had uh, yeah. come out. You know, sometimes it happens. Life gets in the way. It's funny because we were talking about Vertigo, and this is a horror story that's non-zombie, that is decidedly non-vertigo in feel. Hmm. It's a story where it just, it kind of scratches all the itches that you would want in horror comics, and there's <laughs> one genuine plot twist that I did not see coming. And I always love when you have those moments where, you know, it's like, okay, I wouldn't have predicted that. Also, the covers are by Jock, and that's some of his best cover work. So that's the, right. my last... A recommendation and i know this was a book way back that both justin and i were reading on the yep. show it's still in print and trade paperback from dynamite the devilers that's my last recommendation yeah i actually did read the first issue of that but uh kind of like you mentioned I, I had difficulty finding the next issues um you know unfortunately it didn't get probably didn't get ordered a ton uh and then of course some delays you know that kind of it makes it difficult sometimes to uh, to find the singles, but but when they're collected, you don't remember that shit. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, do you have any other recommendations? I know you had a ton that you were talking about with me and through yeah. the Rams. Yeah, well, you, you can just I run mean, through them some quick. I, I I was thinking like maybe some some more recent books. Um, you know, Spread uh, was uh, was an excellent series a couple a uh, couple years ago through Image. Uh, that was Justin Jordan. Um, fantastic sort of post-apocalyptic one uh, with a, sort of a, a, you know, what if the thing uh, from John Carpenter's The Thing just kind of took over everything um, with uh, just a few people left uh, left normal. Um, that's an excellent one. Uh, Curse of Brimstone, uh, again, Justin Jordan. Um, that's a recent DC Dark Age book that has unfortunately been canceled, so... Uh, that also means that if you were um, if you were waiting for the trades, well, you're in luck because there's probably only going to be two, uh, maybe three. But uh, that one with, uh, again, kind of taking a horror bent, uh, maybe a more Swamp Thing almost inspired bent of a or Ghost Rider, I think is probably the closest equivalent 
um, for a, a guy who's, who's um, tricked into making a deal with not a real devil, but sort of a, a demonic uh, emissary from the dark universe um, to quote unquote, save his town. And instead of course, destroys it by becoming a, uh, uh, an agent of, of fire. Um, I'm trying to think there was something else too. Oh yeah. Uh, again, kind of going with like the cross genre stuff, Outer Darkness uh, just started out of Image. Uh, they just released the third issue um, in January. This one's by John Lehman and Afu Chan. Um, it is uh, an extremely unique sci-fi horror in a universe where starships are not powered by you know uh, fusion drives. They're actually powered by demonic gods. And ghosts and demons and possession and uh, all sorts of things are actually just real constant threats uh, in the universe where uh, the ship has a full complement of uh, exorcists uh, that spend most of their time trying to depossess uh, crew members who have been taken over by ghosts that just so happen to wander through the ship. Um, and uh, it's it's very unique, very interesting universe that's being built uh, with outer darkness as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty out there. There's a shockingly large number of great horror comics and series. There's some long running stuff like, uh, Ennis's crossed, which is gory and violent and awful. Um, but also really gross and, and fun to read if you're into that kind of sadistic stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great stuff out there. So, uh, check it out. Okay, Steve, I have a trivia question for you. Sure. Okay. In the time that we've both been alive, mm -hmm. so we'll cut that from 1967 onward, the biggest selling horror trade paperback since we've been alive has been the first volume of The Walking Dead. I don't think that surprises anybody. No, no okay. not at all. What is the biggest selling horror single issue in the time that we've been alive? A single issue? Mm-hmm. This is a comic that sold 1.7 million copies. Well, clearly it isn't something that's recent. Because <laughs> uh, I don't think comics sell that much anymore. Um, oh, man. Top selling single issue horror. Is it a licensed book? No. Huh. So it's not any of the, you know, alien franchises or. Nope. Uh, oh, I am stumped. Okay. This is a comic you may not necessarily immediately think of a horror comic. Spawn number one. Really? Mm hmm. Huh. And yeah, actually, you know what? It's, it's definitely a cross genre. It's superhero horror. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I think I've got my copy somewhere in here as well. So <laughs> and maybe someday you can send your son to college with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can send your son to college with uh, issue number two, uh, yeah. for sure. If he decides Used to go post-grad, you get your copy of Robin 2, Joker's Wild. Um, <laughs> yup. Oh, my God. It's, it's some of those books that sold, like, insane amounts. <laughs> oh, my God. We should do a show about that at some point. Oh, yeah. Those 90s oh, definitely. big sellers. Speculative crap. Oh, yeah. oh, and before I forget, because somebody is going to mention it, I, I know somebody who listens to the show who will definitely mention it, the recent Chilling Adventures of Sabrina book. Oh, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can't, we can't not mention it. All right, well, thank you for joining me for Spooky January. Spooky <laughs> I promise to never do that again unless people really <laughs> want me to do it. At least not in January. Soon it'll be yeah. spooky March. Okay, well, we're going to wrap this episode up, and when we wrap an episode of the comic book Bears Up, we do so with a segment we call the Wolves of the Week segment, where we suggest anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener, may be interested in sampling. Steve, you're going to go first. What is your Wolf of the Week? Well, my Wolf of the Week is a wolf that I've had before, and I'm just bringing it up because Amazon has just announced 
that they have added season three for their streaming, their Amazon Prime streaming service. So now you can watch all three episodes, you, or three seasons. You can binge all of those episodes of The Expanse, um, which is uh, one of my favorite sci-fi series of the past decade. Um, was originally on Sci-Fi Channel. Sci-Fi Channel canceled it, and uh, Amazon picked it up for a fourth season, possibly fourth and final season, most likely. But um, it is an incredible show if you love hard sci-fi um, and just interesting, crazy world building. Um, this is definitely the show for you. Uh, it is beautiful. It is well acted. It has some amazing characters and it's all over the map because you've got so many characters actually to keep track of. You could pretty much say Game of Thrones in space and it wouldn't be too far off. Um, but uh, season four should be coming uh, sometime in the middle of 2019. Uh, but in the meantime, you can binge the first three seasons and hopefully uh, you enjoy it as much as I have. Okay, well, my Woof of the Week is also a return Woof, and it's also a TV series. And for me, I'm going to send my Woof out to Leah Remini, Scientology and its Aftermath. This continues to be the most enjoyable hour of television <laughs> that I encounter every week when it's on. And this past week, they had an episode which detailed the efforts of Scientology to effectively take over the city of Clearwater, Florida where they have had their main base for some time. And I have to say, there is something very attractive about a lot of these former Scientology guys. If you ever see the show you'll, and you see people like Mike Render, you, you'll understand. I believe that there are plans afoot for a very different fourth season. And uh, I like my true TV, and uh, I get that with Leah Remini. So that's my wolf, Lee Remini, Scientology and its aftermath. Okay, we're going to wrap this one up in a spooky little bow. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the Instagram as Comic Book Bears. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears podcast. You can subscribe to us through iTunes. You can listen to us through Stitcher Radio and some of the other podcatcher sites. And if you want to write to us, you can do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. So until next time, I'm Billy Z. And I'm Steve Morey. You're going to hear a woof and an explosion, and we'll be back real soon. Take care, everyone. Woof!